I want to begin by saying thank you so much for sitting down with us for Women's History Month. We are so excited to learn from your unique perspective on leadership. And speaking of, you've had a very impressive and long journey in leadership, and you were a part of Valley Leadership's Institute Class One. Class One. Hmm? What have you learned along the way? <laughs> well, uh, I've learned a lot along the way, and I learned a lot during Valley Leadership, uh, what we then called Valley Leadership. Uh, I saw the Valley's CEOs pull together and decide that our community has a cadre of leadership now, but that cadre will be moving on at some point and we need to grow our own. So it was a, a thoughtful, really brilliant move on the part of our community leaders to say, let's build our future by training people, by introducing people to each other. What I learned along the way probably is that the most important thing is the people. It's getting people, uh, the right people, properly motivated, well prepared, and intent upon making this community better. And that would be the greatest lesson that I've had. I definitely agree with your standpoint on people building a community. And at Valley Leadership, we've embraced Harvard's adaptive leadership model, which really prioritizes bringing in new perspectives. What have you had to be adaptive with in your career? <laughs> you know, every day is an adaptive day, it seems. And maybe I started early. Uh, my dad died when I was 13. Um, at age 13, I went from being a carefree high school kid to, um, to uh, breadwinner for seven, my mother and six kids. And so all of a sudden, I had to adapt to a new way of life. Um, we lived on a farm, it was a distant uh, and a subsistence level farm, I had to adapt. Boy, that's come in handy. It would, I would have never hoped for it. I would have never wanted that for myself or for others. But it was decisive on, there's nobody to do it for you. On a farm, there are no excuses. You got to get it done. You've got to do it. So adaptive behavior is a part of my basic core. And that's come in handy from transitioning from roles like you know, teaching at Harvard to being an astronaut training uh, from living in the United States to representing the United States in Finland as ambassador, from serving in the diplomatic corps, which is ever so different from serving in the Pentagon. The military and diplomatic teams are quite opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, from serving as the president of Thunderbird during an interim period in academic world uh, to the rough and tumble world of corporate America and serving as officer and then board member of Fortune 500 companies. So adaption, uh, adaptation is what I do. And, um, and I think for me, that's what I like. I like being in different settings at different times. I like diversity. And so uh, Valley Leadership was a great way to start for me in seeing a diversity of people and how they handle things. And uh, it has served me very well through the rest of my career. I think that is such a broad range of professions that you have really been a part of. And I think change is such a large part of every industry. And I really love how you connected that back to your personal experiences. You know, at Bear Honors College, one of the main things we are taught is to be able to kind of ebb and flow with the constant evolution of our different industries. How have you seen the impact of higher education change in the women in your lifetime throughout the fields that you've worked in? You know, when I started, uh, it, growing up, the idea was that a girl could grow up to be one of three things, a teacher, a secretary, or a nurse. And it was through higher education, through ASUs, internship program that they had just started. I was in the first class of interns at the state senate. And I got to see a woman senator in a leadership role as the majority leader of the Arizona State Senate, a woman who I chose to emulate, a woman who was such a fine role model for all women in Arizona, uh, in the country, and in the world. The state senator, Sandra Day O'Connor, 
went on to be better known in the judiciary rather than the legislative branch, but higher education was how I got to see her in action. And then seeing her in action, I realized that women are gonna have opportunities, but they're gonna have to be good at what they do and then have a little something extra. And that little something extra could be any of a variety of things, but one was a law degree. And so I pursued a law degree to uh, polish off. I was willing to work, nobody outworks me, but, uh, but I also needed the education in order to be taken seriously. And so I got the law degree and continued building uh, I have a diversity of interests, so I became a pilot. Pilot opened doors that I would never have anticipated, but I certainly have enjoyed. The way you brought together all these different generations of women working together to afford people like me the privilege of higher education, and I definitely am so grateful for all of them. And um, Sandra Day Connor is actually one of my idols, so I really appreciate that you mentioned her. She makes Arizona proud. She makes all women proud. She's very good for the profession of lawyering. She's great for Arizona. She's great as a Republican woman. She's a great role model for all of us uh, as, a, as a community, as a state, as a nation, and as a world. The judiciary around the world admired. I was with her uh, when she was meeting with the leadership in Finland. And to see how her work in rule of law, in encouraging countries to incorporate rule of law into their legal uh, uh, construct mm -hmm. was really impressive to see. And while the United States might tell many of the 194 nations around the world that they ought to have rule of law, that may ring hollow to some developing nations. But if Finland says it, it sometimes is better heard from Finland a smaller country, a country that is derived from a very poor background and has very quickly grown in economic stature, those have incorporating them into the, the cadre of champions for things like rule of law and democracy really is a great way to expand human rights around the world. Sandra O'Connor was a leader in that. That's absolutely amazing. And I didn't even know the connections between Finland and Sandra Day O'Connor, so that's absolutely interesting to hear about. And going back to higher education, um, some of the opportunities that my peers and I are afforded through ASU are just absolutely inspiring. And this is an example of one of them, and I'm so honored to be able to speak with you today. Speaking of opportunities, you have supported women in business in countless ways. One of which being that as a member of the U.S. Afghan Women's Council, you founded Project Artemis, which trained and mentored Afghan women in business at the Thunderbird School of Global Management. What inspired you to be part of such an inspirational project? You know, I watch women in fine circumstances and in destitute circumstances. Women make a difference. And if women get the slightest opportunity, if you give them a hand, they will make the best of it. Working with the women in Afghanistan, you know, it was ASU or it was Thunderbird at the time, separate from ASU, but now a part of ASU. It was Thunderbird who saw the value. When I brought that idea to Thunderbird, they embraced it immediately. I think about every university around the country and around the world, there'd be precious few institutions that would say, yeah, let's invest in the women in Afghanistan. At that time, that wouldn't have been a popular investment. But Thunderbird saw the value of it. And we started a program. They put together a curriculum. They put together a program that included mentoring, classroom work, uh, site visits, and ongoing assistance and performance with these women. As a result of that, others saw it. And one most impressive thing is a well-known company in New York City, Goldman Sachs, a company known for investments, saw what was happening through these women at Thunderbird. They picked up the curriculum. They decided they would make an impact and that that was a good investment. They committed $100 million to, incur, to helping business women around the world and they used exactly the curriculum from Thunderbird. And they asked me to come there to be a part of their announcement that they were gonna influence 10,000 women in the same way that the little Thunderbird program for Afghanistan 
uh, was doing. So ASU and Thunderbird took on a project like Artemis in Afghanistan, and it has been emulated and has affected women in many countries around the world, 60 or so countries around the world, through the expansion uh, that, that Goldman Sachs gave it. But the women who went through the Artemis program, one of them rose to be the Minister of Education, a woman as Minister of Education for Afghanistan. And now with the tragic withdrawal from Afghanistan and the tragic return of the Taliban, she returned to Arizona State University, and I had dinner with her last night. She's back at Thunderbird and, and continuing to work for the women of Afghanistan using ASU and Thunderbird as her lily pad from which she is launching all that assistance. So it's a long answer, but, it's a, uh, but it's a, I have a great passion over what's happened for so many women's lives because of uh, Project Artemis. That's amazing how it came so full circle. Um, I want to say thank you for starting Project Artemis and to the Thunderbird School of um, Global Management as well for creating this opportunity for women and you know um, upholding such an important cause. I was actually reading about a few of the businesses that women who went through Project Artemis started upon returning to Afghanistan yeah. and the ways in which they were able to bolster their communities with those resources is so admirable. and. I think I was sharing it with all my friends and I was telling them about Project Artemis and we are all just so inspired by the work that you, the Thunderbird School of Global Management and these women have done for others. Well, they, you give them the slightest tool mm -hmm. and they put that to use. You may have read some of the businesses. One of the women that I'm most inspired by was in a very traditional area in an area where the women were not allowed out without a male escort, without a father or a, or a husband or a brother or a son escorting her. And she was confined to the, the compound of her home. So she couldn't get out, so she started beekeeping. She kept bees. The bees could go out, mm -hmm. but they would come back and put their honey in the hive in the backyard. She then took the honey with an escort, to the local baker, and the baker used it to great popularity. He wanted a, a, a more consistent supply. You can't raid the honey hives all the time, so he needed a, a more consistent supply. So she franchised beekeeping, mm -hmm. so re inspired other women in their traditional area of Afghanistan to themselves keep bees on the other side of town where they'd be. the bees would be pollinating plants in another, in another part of the community. So beekeeping, uh, it, I don't know if that's one that you read about, but uh, beekeeping is one of the great, one of the many businesses that these women advanced. And I think that's so interesting because it's not a traditional form of business. It's not something you would expect to really sustain a community, but it's amazing how all of these women in different ways yeah. can bring their um, resources together. From beekeeping to volleyball manufacturing to uh, making uh, the wire baskets for erosion control on a construction site, wire baskets in which river rock is placed and then that's used for erosion control, uh, for micro lending, textiles, all of the usual things, hairdressers, a taxi for other women, because women can't get in the car in some settings with a man, so a woman driving the taxi uh, a lot. So these women were inspirational uh, and, in, and filled with ingenuity in coming up with new ideas on how to start a business. It's amazing. It and is amazing. There's like an endless amount of stories I feel like we could read about to um, and it's not just Afghanistan. These lessons have applied around the world, and that's what the Goldman Sachs program did. And then here, Freeport McMoran, headquartered here in Phoenix, mm -hmm. they picked up on it, and they have big operations in Peru. They trained 60,000 women through Thunderbird in Peru. We worked with the Indian reservations here in America. Mm -hmm. There are women there who face uh, uh, challenges that are might seem insurmountable in another setting, but with their own, once a woman is generating income, things change a lot in how they are perceived. They're suddenly a, a part, uh, a contributing part of the family in a new way, and, the, and it helps to build respect uh, for, in the family, both with the husband and with the children. At Valley Leadership, our beginner 
leadership program Catalyze has actually been over 65% women participants in these past two classes. Why do you think more and more women are pursuing personal leadership development and do you have any advice for them? You know, the best thing I can say for women is to make yourself better. Continue to try to improve. Have discipline, set goals, and, and learn how to be efficient and effective with your time. So learn how to run a meeting. Know how to work with people. Be a, the kind of person that other people want to work with. Work to achieve impactful goals. Opposing things are, is easy. It's easy to be the no vote. But what's hard is to design a plan and pursue it to construction or completion and take the slings and arrows that come with being the one who's building something. Uh, and, and I think when you develop the pattern of habits that it takes to build new things, you really become an addition to the community and someone who is making the community better. Our community, like every other community, I say to myself every day when I wake up, I love living here. I, and the more I travel, the more I realize how much I love living here. But we can get better. And that's our duty, that's what leadership is, and that's what always working to improve, finding excuses to figure out how I can be better, how I can have my immediate family get better, how I can have then my broader community get better, and then my state, my country, and the world. I think that is amazing advice for anyone pursuing leadership because I feel like you have to be able to always incorporate new perspectives as we grow and change, um, especially in this day and age. How can different communities here in Arizona take all these issues that are in our plates and, you know, it can be daunting? How do you think that these pressing issues, is there a pressing issue that you think needs to be addressed by Arizona leaders now? You know, when you ask about what's the greatest issue, I go through the catalog. I think about, yeah, water. We're a desert. Water's scarce. It's been, there's been a drought. I think about housing. I think about it all is with about education. And if we're not tops in education, we're losing. We've got pockets of absolute excellence, the best in the country, and in some cases, the best in the world in education, but it's too much a pocket. It's not broadly enough. We're leaving people behind, and that ought not be permissible. But when I think of all of the topics we could address or we could focus on, the bottom line is it's all leadership. The bottom line is for Arizona to be the best that it can be, we need leadership. We need great leadership. We need diverse leadership. We need leadership that look at things from different angles and different directions and then work together, not in opposition, but together to move forward and build something and, and to make sure we have water, education, housing, an environment that we all want to live in. And so I think that a program like uh, what I knew as Valley Leadership and with Catalyze and the institutes that, that are the current era, I think it's a great thing and that's how we will solve those problems. Definitely, I think the issue with the housing crisis and the water crisis and education is that they're all so interconnected. You know, you can't pursue opportunities in education without having a stable home. You can't pursue opportunities to better your community without bettering yourself first. And I think that since all of it is so interconnected, um, Valley Leadership's impact teams, the housing impact team and the education impact team, they're really all working together as we speak to address these issues. Well, let me say one other thing. We need to be attentive as we are. We are really focused on paying attention to the, prop, to the, the lowest era. We will only succeed if we also are paying attention to the very, are we being, are, are the top being held back or are the top uh, excelling? And so we need to make sure that we are in, in moving the entire spectrum forward and positively. Uh, the, uh, as is often said, poverty is no friend of the environment. We, we have to have viable industry and viable um, people in the community in order to uh, afford the uh, sometimes economically challenging things that it takes to have a good education system 
favorable health care. Again, we've got fabulous health care facilities with Mayo Clinic and Barrow and, uh, and, the, and now academic uh, medical schools here of the top quality and, and cutting new ground, rethinking the processes, innovating in healthcare education. Uh, but all of those, we need to be attentive from bottom to top to um, in pursuing as much excellence as within as is within our capability. Yes, I definitely agree. Working towards a place of equity over equality. And I think that that is some amazing insight that obviously you have to have a lot of perspective in all of these fields to know about. So I really appreciate that. But we need to, we need to embrace talent. Mm -hmm. We need to build talent, embrace talent, engage talent. We need to be uh, pulling with everybody who's willing to pull. Let's make our community a better place. Lastly, do you have any other advice for women in business today um, working towards their goals? Women excel when they team up, and uh, working with other women is a great uh, is a great way to move forward. But it's also important to work with the men. Uh, I am of the era where no woman could move forward if the men were holding her back, uh, because the men were in all the power positions. And so you have to be able to work with the men and the women in the community. And uh, I think women have, they've got that, and and they're doing great things. And and we just need to. I think, cheer them on, uh, support them. Uh, and I want to say I would like to express my gratitude for the extreme privileges I've had offered by ASU, offered by Valley Leadership. And those, those institutions have really been the boost that I uh, needed in order to have a career that I have enjoyed immensely. Thank you so much for sitting down with us today, Ambassador Barrett. It has been a privilege to be able to learn from your unique perspective on leadership. My pleasure.